Hello and welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the first our first event of 2021. Um, we almost managed to make it two weeks in before before uh, having yet another online event. Um, so um, I'm really pleased to welcome Adrian Buckner uh, to read for us. Uh, before I hand over to Adrian, um, I'll just go through a couple of things. Um, Feel free to use the chat box as you wish to talk to each other or to say hello to us. Um, the structure of the event will be Adrian, well, I will briefly introduce Adrian um, and then he'll read for about half an hour or so and then we'll have 10 minutes for Q&A or any discussion or any comments that you might want to make. If you want to ask Adrian a question um, after he's finished reading, please put it in the Q&A box rather than the chat box because there's quite a lot of people here and I suspect that I won't be able to keep an eye on the chat box to catch all the questions as they go by. So please use the Q&A box. Um, all of Adrian's three books, which I will list shortly, are still available. I'll put the links to them in the chat. You can buy them from Five Leaves Bookshop um, online, um, or I'm sure Adrian's got copies that he can uh, sell you if you want. Um, so Adrian is a very fine poet. He's a senior lecturer in creative writing at the University of Derby. Um, in 1999, he became the first Nottinghamshire Poet Laureate. I don't know if he was living in Nottinghamshire at the time, were you? Was. You were? Oh, good. So that's all right then. Um, he, <laughs> he edited Poetry Nottingham, which was rebranded as Ascent in 2009, and he was also on the editorial board for Staple magazine. I don't know if um, any of you remember that. Much much loved and much missed. Um, he's published two collections and a pamphlet with five leaves. Uh, Downshifting contains mild peril and bedtime reading. Uh, his poetry contains many references to cricket and trees and literature and many other things. Um, and I first met Adrian when I was studying creative and professional writing at the University of Nottingham. Um, he made quite an impression on me as not only as an excellent poetry teacher, but also as the only one of our lecturers who ever read out a piece of work, um, not his, I hasten to add, uh, containing the C word. Um, um, I can still remember that. I think he was quite embarrassed about it, but uh, it was an excellent poem, so it was worth it. So uh, without further ado, I shall hand over to Adrian. I'm going to vanish, but I'm still here. OK, thank you, Pippa. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for staying in on such a horrible night. And um, especially if you've been on Zoom for five hours today, thank you for um, staying on for another hour. Um, I'd like to start with a very light, rather rueful poem, uh, which contains an utterly implausible proposal. It is still possible to live as if the computer is just that thing on your desk at work, to play the waltz all dreamy afternoon, to read every word of Daniel de Ronda, to recall the trees of childhood, to name them with your own children, to look into the heart of one thing, to stand transfixed at the side of roads leading everywhere else and nowhere. Um, I've arranged this uh, reading into sort of three, four clutches of three poems each. Um, and the first uh, is called White. And this um, is a very simple lyric about uh, the lack of snow, snow blossoms. No snow fell that winter, not a week stilled in white, not one dawn covering on the lawn. All spring he gazed at, grazed in white, star blossoms of blackthorn, high round heads of hawthorn, crab, cornel and cotton tree. In blousy summer, 
He reached and stooped for the white undersides of poplar and white beam, daydreamed in autumn of the coming snow. Um, the next one is uh, kind of autobiographical. Um, it's really about um, just one afternoon when I um, decided not to go on a jog. Um, just for a little bit of context, uh, explanation really for the bottom of the, the end of the poem. Um, uh, both my, our children just uh, were away at university at the time. Abandonment in white. Tomorrow when this has thawed, I will trot hobble my three miles. Today I am a stay at home jogger, ticking over in my sixth decade. Today I'll feel for the ache on the right side of my neck. Stretch the hamstring a little longer, a little slower. Today I'll look at the peach ribbon you have tied to secure the two paper white narcissi that couldn't stand with the bunch. Today we will sit in the kitchen, watch the snow settle, the pine loading and the birch crystallizing in space. Admit to each other in silence that we are the children outside, hoping it never stops. And in the afternoon, make calls to our own children. Um, and yes, this poem, The Inkwell, the only thing I want to say about this is that I had, it kind of has an alternative title in my head, which is Against the Imagination. They had it wrong, those early praises, scrawling such a way with words, such a vivid imagination across your childhood books. From the very first, your gaze was inward, never wide, closing your wings like a falcon around your scraps of food. You fix from there your eyes upon the inkwell on the corner of the desk. Snow was not for mountain tops. It settled a crystalline inch on the sash's frame. Rain, no exhilarating lash, but a soft descent on a green field of play. For just long enough, a commandment came from what you took for heaven. Thou shalt make poems all your life and never cease to hope for something in the mail. And now um, three poems that I, uh, all in some ways got to do with an educational setting. Um, and the first uh, has a rather odd title. Um, I quite like using unpoetic titles or found titles. And uh, the title you can see there um, is uh, just a heading on an email which came round to um, myself and fellow academics at Derby. Um, and it just caught me in the middle of a rather self-indulgent, self-centred reverie of my own life and childhood. So provide brief bullet points of your specific research specialisms. Running back to school after lunch, I fell and grashed my knee. A neighbour took me home, delivering a beautiful afternoon. I watched a cinema I'd never entered, being demolished in the high street. When I heard Gabriel Fitzpatrick had split her head open, I blanched at the vision, avoided for good that legendary spot. I fell in love with cricket. It rained three summers and hardly happened. I was worse than 33rd in a subject called technical drawing. I went from altar boy to feminist, having no sex twice. At university, I went to no lectures, read all the Russians and Hardy. I thought about teaching, then thought again. I slept in the afternoon, woke to the lilies past their seven days. Um, 
if anyone can spot the um, slight, well, the steel from Dylan Thomas, I'll, in that last poem, I'll be very impressed. I will buy you a pint. In fact, I'd like to buy everyone a pint <laughs> if we could just do that sometime. Um, uh, yes, this next poem, um, poem dedicated to everyone and everything in it, but it's mostly dedicated um, to my friend Paul, um, who is now a friend of more than 40 years, at least 45. Uh, and it's a poem with, uh, I should, perhaps there's one slightly obscure reference to it. Um, I don't know um, if anyone has a memory of um, uh, la little laundry uh, capsules, uh, blue bags, um, some kind of uh, coloring or, or, um, or softener that went in washing machines that were that was used also in some instances for um, uh, salving insect bites, wasp bites. It seems very strange. A lot of people, even my own age, look at me and say, no, that didn't happen. Uh, but, but I can assure you it did. Um, I've looked it up and I do have a very vague memory of, um, of, of, of that uh, blue dye um, being associated with a wasp thing. Um, so this um, has three sort of quite disparate parts to it, this poem. Um, I hope it's not just in my head that they kind of cohere. Um, a friend of 40 years has messaged me to say he is reading my poems on a near deserted Isle of Wight ferry. He says this feels apposite. I could return a wry, mock-offended question, but feel a warm stun of assent. A student has written, this poet seems addicted to these small observations. I scrawl, and what is wrong with that? Then decide to grade generously the probing naivety. Three days ago, an academic colleague delivered a fascinating seminar of which I remember nothing. Though seven years ago, she told me a wasp stung her on the elbow and she spent an hour watching the blue balm of childhood spread from a small muslin bag she found when clearing her mother's house. Um, I used to work in adult education um, and um, I think my friend Bob Mulder is, um, is, is here in the audience. So this is sort of for you, Bob, because um, we both know that world where certain courses and projects in adult education depend on people turning up. And sometimes you don't know until the very last um, hour, really. Uh, but And this is kind of like a little love letter to the idea of adult education and the, the WEA and the, the fine ideals um, in that organisation. The course not viable. I'm informed at reception that a third gentleman has inquired. I will wait for another eight to take the road through February sleet. David is the second of two. I could be seven people. I like seven types of poetry. Does that help? Lovely idea, says our branch official. Specs, corduroys and shyly brightening with the so, slow smile of a lifetime's gentle behaviour. No calling for execution, his instincts to console. He stays to make a four for what the office call a taster. I joke feebly about 60 years poetry in an hour, decide against Douglas's how to kill and give out James Wright's the blessing instead. Later on the bus, I remember I had Larkin in reserve. Who will be the last, the very last? Gradually, we find ways of talking about things other than poetry. At the close, we shake hands in the foyer. David says in morale boosting style that he specializes in finding oases and then moving on to the next deserts. 
When the moment presents, I do not suggest the pub or point in the listings to dates for open mic poetry and creative writing courses. We did not come to pluck from that sexy fruiting tree the city's cultural offer. We did not come to be vibrant, seek new opportunities. We came to do this once a week, saw there were not enough of us, spoke a blessing, brushed up on wistful irony and left. Um, my next um, little set of three, I'd, I'd quite like to read these um, without sort of saying anything in between really, so I'll just introduce them as a, as a three um, at the outset here. Um, the second of them, uh, sorry, uh, called the Scots Pine is, um, it has a little bit of fun, but also respects the current um, science and fashion, which is quite interested in the ideas of trees uh, communicating with each other. Um, and the first and third poems kind of um, hopefully link up to that. Um, and they have a sort of sense in common uh, that I have that I think for a lot of us, and certainly for me, um, trees and the natural world have kind of waited for us, uh, for us kind of suburban city people, as I think of myself as, to sort of notice. Clearing his father's house. And finally, that afternoon, the attic where he finds them, the observer's book of trees, Cacti, butterflies, pond life, lichens, ferns, ships. The first 48 volumes stashed and stacked in rubber banded bundles of four and six to fit the width and give of a Pan American hold all. A parent's duty, a parent's gift for an inattentive child who thought it cool at 16 to sport his copy of Camus left the family home at 18 and so seldom returned. But recalls in the attic afternoon, the Robert Louis rhymes at bedtime, animals of the world and a mile of Norfolk beach on an August evening. Leaving the house, he steps into a child's wide and open loss, raises his eyes and wonders, what is the name of that tree? the Scots pine. Those who love us know that we talk among ourselves, warnings whispered in the wind of the burrowing hereabouts pest, a communal caress of murmur. Otherwise we are mute. Further acts of speech could lead to all manner of untree-like behavior. I might feel in my roots a blighting worm of envy for the beach's incomparable summer shade, its blazing autumnal show. A contempt canker for boulevard limes, yellow and half nude by September's end. Merely a destructive mite of cruelty for the chestnut's yearly sickness plea. I stand unfailing through season's change, weather beaten, enduring. My leaves stay with me two years. I cast off my weaker branches. I contend the legend of the oak. Nothing is more blasted than me. The monkey puzzle and the unnamed tree. Home. The prize for being exotic, an Englishman will plant you in the middle of his front lawn and the tree guide boasts that the best specimens in these aisles surpass those in their natural home. Memory pins it at about six foot on my haunches, wary of the spine tipped leaves. I'd nudge the low branches and see them bob heavily in the summer heat, like the bumblebee in the borders. Park, half a mile away, Older boys hurled sticks into the chestnut to bring the conkers down. This was considered vaguely yobbish. 
On the derelict cricket pavilion, Gaz announced his, announced his presence in red spray can. Lisa, more decorous, declared love for Rob. And the tree I couldn't have named, waiting like a patient deity, it to spring now across my mind's eye, cedar of Lebanon, its level platters of leaves, love offerings to a child on his haunches, eyes to the ground. I've just realised that I have mentioned cricket twice. I, was, I don't think I was going to tonight. I, had, I don't think that was the C word that Pippa was referring to. Um, the, the, the last um, uh, three poems are all written relatively recently, um, and I've given them the sort of overall title of Neighbourhood. Um, and they kind of, for me, express the spirit of suburbia. Um, and the first one is called World on the Mail Mat, and it's light, rhyming. Uh, I do have a quite a deal of respect for people who can do that, who can write light poetry, which kind of just tremors with a little bit above the lightness, but doesn't overburden it. Um, so this is my kind of attempt to write in that style. Um, and I wrote it uh, when, you know, those little listings that come through everybody's uh, um, uh, mailbox, you know, when you can buy a fish tank or find a plumber or join a, um, a, a help group. World on the mail mat. Read a poem for spring in the community hall. Call Dave on this number. No job is too small. Prayer, praise and pancakes at 11 a.m. Wild edible herbs and where you can find them. Retired teachers take a hike in the woods. Note first all fungi with poisonous hoods. Parent and toddler St. Edmund's Church crypt. Summer holes boredom. Here are 10 tips. Goalkeeper needed for our under 12s, costume provided for your seasonal elves. Collections wanted, single items considered. Local tree surgeon if your willow has withered. Fish tank and pump, 30 quid or your nearest. Share in the library, those memories your dearest. Season of single gloves, uh, plain title. Um, does anyone come back to pick up a glove that is kindly placed um, by someone? Um, season of single gloves. Buds clustered, woolly, usually in fives. Closer inspection reveals varying length. Occasional sightings of small specimens with one bud oppressed to larger companion. Early season colorings frequently bright, patterned, glossy dark examples rare and late in season. Favors low walls, park benches, rare climbing variant can ascend a railing, known locally as lost by melancholy preserving spirits. Um, and the last in the three is called Days. Again, um, this is a very light poem. Um, lots of uh, memories for me, actually, of living of, of part, a time in my life when I was um, home with a young child, primarily. And this particular poem was animated for me by an image, I'm sure you'll be familiar with it, of a young mother with the left hand on a stroller and the right hand sort of leaning back patiently and indulgently towards a little toddler who was kind of engaged with a, a snail or a dried up worm or something. Days. Those days of small gatherings, 
those days of quiet notice, those days at the school gate, those days at the library meeting, those middle of the day days, those nine to half past two days. Those days of changes in the leaves, those days that fare up later, those days of must be getting on, those days of same, same time Thursday, those middle of the day days, those nine to half past two days. Those days for a spot of weeding, those days of her afternoon nap, those days when the gutters cleared, those days when he's home at five, those middle of the day days, those nine to half past two days. Those days when a baby walks, those days someone pays a call, those days when a letter's written, those days when snow nearly settles, those middle of the day days, those nine to half past two days. Those days when nothing ruins, those days of lenient time, those days you just gaze out on, those days of heart's repose, those middle of the day days, those now nine to half past two days. And um, uh, just to finish, actually, the last poem, um, uh, as an amusing comment by a sort of literary wag who, commenting on the career of, po of poets, I think, said, um, problem is it's very difficult to know what to do with that huge gulf of time between early promise and too late. Um, which is uh, which amused me and left me slightly rueful. Um, and the title for this, not quite for us, uh, those of you who have who have sent poems off to magazines um, or publishers uh, will probably be will have had something occasionally like this. That one's never quite sure whether the emphasis, which of those four words, the title, the emphasis should be on on the rejection slip. Not quite for us. For five decades, they have centimetered, millimetered toward the middle of one shelf, each on a numbered page in a single volume. An accepted poem, an enjoyed poem, a thoroughly enjoyed poem, a commended poem, a shortlisted poem, a longlisted poem, a selected poem. A paid for poem, a paid to be published poem, a revised and resubmitted poem, a published overseas poem, a published with a line drawing poem, a published under a non de plume poem, a poem of vivid early promise, a poem about that special coastal light. And that's my poems for tonight. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Adrian. That was um, that was really, really enjoyable. I mean, I've obviously read all the poems a couple of times um, with getting them ready for screen sharing and everything, but it's, it just makes so much difference to uh, hear you read them. And, and I found myself laughing out loud at bits that I hadn't actually noticed when I was reading them on the page. So thank you very, very much for that. That was wonderful. Um, so questions um we've actually got some questions already in the um q a box but i'm going to get in first because i'm in charge um i just wondered um if you could say just briefly why you, you thought it was uh necessary or useful to um communicate the the sort of order of the poems that you were going to be reading and the rationale behind it before people came along to the reading um, I'm just a bit too up myself, really. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, well, interesting enough, my, my wife said something to me, which I thought was quite thoughtful about poetry readings. We used to go to quite a lot together. And she said that I've always, always enjoy listening to the poems because I'm thinking, you know, I'm aware that there's been care and time taken over the structure and everything behind it 
and I enjoy the questions, but sometimes the sort of um, the chat in between the general kind of hesitation on the part of the presenter of the, of the poems or um, seem to sort of slightly distract from things. I mean, I've been guilty of that in the past. I've done that. I've done poetry readings where I've, you know, dropped the paper, not being sure which page to find to find the poem I'm going to read. So I was interested to think of this reading as one where I would decide what I was going to to, 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 to read on a particular afternoon a few weeks ago um, so that I wouldn't be tempted to say, to think today, oh, I, I don't feel like reading that one now, or I'm unsure about that, I'll bring that in, and oh, I'm worried. And I thought, no, I need to, to, to be sure. And I, I, I enjoyed sort of constructing it. Uh, I mean, uh, someone, a musician doesn't sort of, turn up at the concert hall and think, oh, I don't feel like playing the Schubert, I'll, I'll, I'll play the Beethoven quartet. So, I mean, I, it is a, perhaps a little bit pretentious for me to, to say that, but I just wanted it to, I enjoyed preparing in this way and thinking about putting the poems in little groups because they don't, some of them I wrote a long time ago, others are quite recent. So I, I've kind of linked them um, uh, by theme. Um, but I just enjoyed doing it really. I just enjoyed preparing in that way. Fair enough. I I, I really appreciated it. Um, it was. Uh, I like the way you kind of explain where you're coming from. So um, in the blurb for uh, downshifting, hmm. you you kind of it kind of says what sort of poetry you write and why you write it and gives us a few hints as to what's going on behind the poems themselves which I think is uh, really interesting mm -hmm. anyway we have we have seven questions so uh, if we're going to get through them all we can have to be quick answers so Dave Holloway's um, said it's a pleasure to be here this evening which is very kind of him it's lovely to have you Dave um, could you talk a bit about how and why cricket has been a subject for you over the years um, and has its poetic resonance shifted or changed at all over the years? Thank you, Dave. You know the answer to this question, Dave. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no, no. Um, I used to think years ago that I, uh, that cricket was in one part of my life and literature was in the other. And as I grew older, um, and became wiser perhaps I realized that for me they were they had lots in common uh, in the same way that I desperately try and scrape a few runs together on a cricket field um, there's something akin to that with trying to get poems published uh, for me I'm not sure if that's that clear but um, I think it was because as a young child Dave I paid a, a great deal of attention to cricket I was quite interior. I wasn't very good at it. So I decided to sort of love it in a, in a way that I think only people who aren't sort of highly um, skilled can. Um, but yes, and I, and I, yes, I think that's all I can say on that actually. Um, it's, it's a lyrical spectacle for me. And I think cricket for me is also landscape. I, I still think even if, if you have no interest in cricket, the sight of, of village of, of cricketers on a green, people will look and they will be, they will enjoy it. The fact that it, it, it's there. So I think that something of that answers to me in, in me as well. What do you, what do you mean by um, you love it in the way that people who aren't very good at it only people who aren't very good at it can. I think if you're really, I, I just remember at 11 or at 12 when I realized, when I took this um, sort of passionate interest in the statistics and the personalities involved, the international players, um, I wasn't, there were lads at school who were far stronger, better and skilled. And I think, they took the, the pleasure of the success of the actual athletic activity. And um, 
I mean, I have actually written a poem, a, a, a lyrical ballad on this subject, really, um, which I might read a, another time. Um, but I thought, well, they're, they're kind of brutish with their prowess. I have to somehow have an aesthetic appreciation of the game. Mm. Um, yeah, OK, that makes sense. Hmm. Thank you. Um, OK, so Jennifer Robinson says, in Downshifting, you write, the free sylvan spirit is really not my thing. There's my place beneath the stars, a man smoking outside an industrial unit. Um, why do you feel this, given that you write a lot about open spaces, trees, grass, snow? Uh, yeah, I think, yes. Um, I think the personality in that poem was somewhat of an adopted persona um, and it, that's quite a, that particular poem that Jennifer's re referring to is is takes quite a sort of rhetorical stance on something um, uh, yes it, it's not me in that poem though there's a lot of me in it um, and I do I do have a sort of attraction to that kind of urban pastoral as well. So, so perhaps just juxtaposing that next to the idea of the, the free sylvan spirit, which as a phrase is quite a kind of ironic, slightly stylized um, phrasing, I think. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because you can explore all sorts of different aspects of yourself mm. and of aspects that aren't of yourself in poetry quite effectively, can't you? I mean, you do, you do it mm. pretty effectively. Gosh, that was a tough question, Jenny. I'm going to have to think about that. <laughs> that, was, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, um, right. So Alan Baker wants to know, what role you think religion and or spirituality plays in your poems, particularly the ones about your childhood? Um, I went to Catholic primary school, Catholic secondary school. Um, and I, oh, Catholicism, it's a resource I wouldn't have missed for the world for, as a writer. Um, I, I adore the art of, of, of the Renaissance. Um, I, I don't sort of identify myself as any, uh, uh, with any particular belief now, but I feel I have a sort of slightly religious sensibility. Um, so yeah, I, I think it infuses and I have, um, I have one or two poems. I think actually, Alan, it's interesting that Alan asked that question because in the um, pamphlet that he kindly published from me for Leaf Press in 2004, there are two poems that, that deal directly uh, with memories of, of, and fond memories actually, as, as well of, of, of being a um, sort of, not pious child, but sort of, slightly frightened, obedient little Catholic boy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks, Alan, for that. So Ian Popple wants to know what makes a good ending to a poem? Um, oh, Ian. <laughs> Tough one. The best, the best couplet in, in the poem that you've just written. Um, I guess yes, it's it's a it's a tough one that because one tries to resist um, that sort of that too much of a round a climactic end where you round off with a nice little epiphany or a sort of moment of sensitive reckoning. But of course, I'm aware of the temptations of that. Um, I don't know. I think poems sometimes round up. Sometimes you get out of them quickly. Uh, with a bit of a, a startle. Um, uh, yeah, 
I think that's, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I could write something about that. I think it's an interesting subject. Um, but I think that's all I've got on that one. Yeah, I don't oh, know. Full of last lines. Mm. Richard Palmer said the answer is the last line. <laughs> um, yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> oh, uh, he's my personal reading assistant from now on. <laughs> when I... Um, let's have a look. So another one from Jennifer Robinson. Uh, there's a lot of implied narrative about your own life in your poems. Do you think you're writing a kind of poetic autobiography? Um, yes, I, I, I think that's that's fair, and I think that would um, I I would. I'm I'm sure I'm sure that the observation from Jenny there is is not meant in this spirit, but I know that that can sometimes come from a uh, from a certain mindset to which I'm kind of defensive. Um, you know, the idea that one shouldn't over populate poems with 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 personal reminiscence. Um, I think um, that when I come to do a reading, I think there's probably a little bit of a bias towards those kind of poems. Um, I'm kind of I'm, I'm engaged on other work which has less of a um, explicitly kind of autobiographical narrative uh, but then even then of course any um, oh no I, I didn't for a minute um, Jenny take it as criticism um, from you <laughs> um, uh, but and I guess even poems that don't do that um, are about oneself as well aren't they it's just a different sort of medium of expressing something um but yeah i i'm i'm yes i think i could it'd be interesting to sort of separate those poems out those that are purely autobiographical and those that adopt a different kind of first person i because um the poem that that jenny referred to earlier um that, that had the quote about the sylvan spirit that again would be a first person poem the, the the title poem of downshifting but that would be an assumed person rather than um, a poem such as um the one i read today um poem dedicated to everyone and everything in it which was three things that literally happened um in my life on, on a, spread out from just a couple of days so yeah different different things but the same thing <laughs> thank you um okay uh so nathan fiddler has asked are there any poems or poets you found a new comfort in during the multiple lockdowns um i think i would say to that nathan that i've continued to the the poems that i turned to um were the same this year as they were the previous year when we weren't in lockdown so no specific um new poetry um specifically for that purpose um uh, Elizabeth Bishop and Auden, I always talk about them. I always go back to them. They're the ones by the bedside. Um, um, so really the answer to that is no. Not I, I'm interested in this, the whole idea of what's going to come out of lockdown as regards poetry, but my interest is kind of limited on that as well, because I think it would be strange if it provoked... Um, a, a, a whole new kind of poetry and I, I'd be sort of slightly reluctant to engage with it I think but there will be obviously there will be a classic lockdown poem maybe our poet laureate's going to write it for us I don't know we'll see um a kind of related question from Valerie Francis is there a poem that you love or admire that you would like to have written um that I would like to have written. 
Um, I, I'm going to try and answer that in, I would like to, if I can answer that in a more general uh, fashion, I'd like to accomplish, I think this is slightly to do with what I was saying about my admiration for lightness, which I mentioned in the, um, uh, when I was talking about those last three poems. I'd like to write a poem that had the, the same impact or a similar kind of appeal to people as a song like Return to Sender. <laughs> um, which I don't know, it seems like a very odd thing to say, but I do, uh, I envy that um, facility of popular song to get under the skin of people, um, that, that sort of memorability. Um, as to poetry itself, uh, it's not so much specific poems, it's poets whose minds I admire. Um, I mean, in some senses, Auden is, is too beyond and too various to, to even be worth envying. Um, but there are ballads of his, such as James Honeyman and Miss G, um, which have a kind of lightness and sting, which I feel properly envious of, I think. Thank you. Um interesting you mentioned yeah okay so question from Matthew Cheeseman that sort of leads on from that um he's interested in the tremor you spoke of above the light verse do you set out to write that tremor can you write light verse without that tremor um well it the tremor yes um did I use that word it's perfect to describe what I meant. So even if I didn't use it, I'm going to steal it from you now, Matthew. <laughs> Is that, I don't know, it, it's, a, it's a difficult one. I, I'm not sure, when I think of light verse, I have um, a, a sense of that as being not just light in subject, um, but if I, write a poem quickly and I don't change it much, it comes quickly, even if it could be of quite a, a grievous in nature or amusing, you know, whatever along the spectrum, I think of that as light, um, lightly, sort of almost lightly undertaken. Um, the, tr the tremor, which I, I do like that word, um, in, in that poem, for instance, uh, World on the Mail Map, which was just a list of, of, of um, sort of adapted notices and adverts in, 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 in a little magazine there. Um, I guess in that poem, the tremor for me was the sense of um, the lift in the final line about um, memories and, um, and, 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 and being dear to someone. And being part of this community. Um, but your question as to whether it's possible to write a light verse without a tremor, a purely um, light piece of throwaway verse, um, I think we're possibly in other territory there. So no, I wouldn't want to write light verse without a tremor. Um, whether you could do it without it, not sure. Again, another question that I'm not sure on. But a great one. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that. OK, we've got two more, um, which I think we can just about squeeze in. Uh, OK, so Moy McCrory has asked, when you first started writing poetry, were you aware of influences and which poets were you reading or did you find inspiring? When I first started, Moy, I was a... I fancied myself as a interior dreamy kind of youth and um, Brian Patton was the man for me. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I went to, you know, who didn't, who didn't buy the Liverpool poets and uh, think they were the, um, the bee's knees at the time. I mean, I, I think I mentioned this in our interview um, uh, 
Pippa, mm -hmm. that um, when I was sort of in fifth form, sixth form, you know, I, I was I was enjoying that that kind of poetry, you know, the the, the, um, the, the Liverpool sound and, and other associated kind of um, voices. And also I was aware that doing A-levels, I was studying a kind of rock of literature with Shakespeare and John Donne and, 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 and what have you. So, and I started to sort of think, well, where does, you know, all this sort of cohere together? Um, but yeah, the brief answer is um, Brian Patton was my man, really. Yeah, you couldn't start with a better one, really. Well, there probably are ones that you could start with that are better, but I can't think of them. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, nice question to finish with from Valerie Francis again, um, who says really enjoyable and interesting. Thank you. So that's good. Um, is there a thematic progression in your work? Um, I think what I've started to do recently is to I, I don't I'm not too schematic about um, the progress of poetry. I'm always a little bit in awe and slightly sceptical when people say, I don't know, I've, I'm going to write a series of odes about the Council of Trent or something because I'm in <laughs> um, So that, that sounds a little bit trivial, but um, if, if people say, when I, when, if everyone ever asks me, what are you working on? I generally tend to say, and it's not meant as a flip, response well I'm writing I'm working on the poem I'm writing at the moment um, I don't think in terms of collections um, though uh, and Valerie will have an intimation of this I am currently very interested in writing uh, a series of poems about art and uh, uh, I've sort of set myself a, a sort of quite a, a, a strict um, sort of format for these poems. They're all the same length, responses to individual pieces of art. Um, so I don't know whether that's a thematic progression because I think I, 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 I pursue some of the themes in my poetry through those poems as well. Um, but um, but it's, it's certainly a, 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 a change and I, and I hope a development, yes, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you ever so much for uh, reading for us and answering those questions. Lots of really interesting questions and really interesting answers. Um, and I'll just let everyone know that you can still buy all of Adrian's Five Leaves books at Five Leaves Bookshop. Um, I put links in the chat, so uh, and they will be under the YouTube um, recording as well when when I manage to get that online. So. Um, if you wanted to delve further into Adrian's poetry, that's a good way of doing it. Um, Adrian, would you happen to have a short poem to read us out with, maybe? Um, thank you. Yes, uh, I, I would just like to, to thank you for, for, for arranging it. And, and I, I am generally touched by everyone coming on to Zoom to, to, to listen to me reading. Well, thank you for those very thought-provoking questions um, and in fact the last one and my sort of rambling answer to it has um, slightly altered what I was going to do here at the end. I am going to read one of my very uh, short poems um, about art. Um, we don't have the image here but um, I was particularly taken um, with a, a, an abstract artist called Fiona Ray, who has a, um, uh, a picture from 2012 called I Need Gentle Conversations. And uh, uh, I've also, in this very short poem, I've mentioned Elvis Presley or Return to Zendo <laughs> earlier on in this. Um, there's a kind of Bert Bacharach thing here going on as well. Um, so this is just a response to I Need Gentle Conversations by Fiona Ray, uh, which I, I really hope that you'll take the chance to, to look up and to, to find an image of this uh, a lovely piece of art um, when you leave here. Um, I am the paint, the strokes, the shapes, 
Every lush surprise on a work of art by Fiona Ray. Charmed to my toes when she stood back from me to give me this name. What the world needs now is gentle conversations. It's the only thing there's never been a picture of. Thank you. Thank you so much and thank you everyone for coming along.